Hi, this is Dr. K from my medical school, and today we have a 56-year-old male who presents with numbness and tingling in his lower legs. Stick around to learn more about this patient, but also make sure to check out all our free educational content at our YouTube channel, iMedical School, and listen to our podcast on iTunes and Google Play. A 56-year-old male presents with numbness and tingling in his lower legs with a burning sensation in his tongue. He has a history of hypothyroidism and is currently on levothyroxine for treatment. In addition, he has a history of chronic pancreatitis related to prior alcohol use, but he's been sober for 10 years. You complete a physical exam where you find he has a smooth appearing tongue. His legs show impaired vibration sense with increased spasticity though he has normal sensation and reflexes in his arms. Lab work is completed that shows a hemoglobin of 11.2 with a mean corpuscular volume or MCV of 110 and a normal red cell distribution width or RDW. What are your differential diagnoses? When approaching any clinical scenario, it's always important to think broadly and come up with several diagnoses that you are entertaining. Let's review some potential diagnoses to focus on, and then let's talk about what is most likely going on here. When we think of numbness and tingling in the legs, this describes a neuropathy. Neuropathies can be caused by many things such as diseases and medications, but one of the most common causes is diabetes. This is the reason the diabetic foot exam is so important, as it can allow us to identify neuropathy early and address complications like infections before they become a serious issue. Given his history of chronic pancreatitis, we should seriously consider diabetes as scarring in the pancreas can lead to destruction of beta cells in the pancreas, which leads to diabetes. Another cause of neuropathy with spasticity includes hypocalcemia or low calcium. Decreased calcium can occur with hypoparathyroidism or severe vitamin D deficiency. Parathyroid hormone is released when calcium levels are low. Parathyroid hormone increases the release of calcium from bone. If there is an autoimmune destruction of the parathyroid, or if thyroid surgery leads to damage to the parathyroid gland, hypoparathyroidism can result. In addition, given our patient has chronic pancreatitis, he may have low vitamin D levels, as his pancreas may not be producing the enzymes for fat absorption. Vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin and needs the pancreatic enzymes to digest fats to be absorbed. Other relatively common deficiencies that can cause a similar picture are B12 and folate deficiencies. B12 and folate deficiencies will be our main focus for this episode. B12 and folate are water-soluble vitamins that we obtain from our diet. We need B12 and folate because they are required for the production of cells that are produced in our bone marrow, like red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. B12 is traditionally found in meats, while folate is typically found in greens and grains. B12 and folate are absorbed through different methods. B12 is bound to proteins in meat. When we eat meat, stomach acid breaks up the protein structure of the meat. B12 is released and binds to a protein called the R protein. R protein is produced by salivary glands in the mouth and bind the B12 as it is released. The B12 R protein complex then passes into the small bowel. In the small bowel, pancreatic proteases, which are enzymes, break apart the B12 and R protein complexes. During this process, parietal cells, which are located in the stomach, secrete a protein called intrinsic factor. Intrinsic factor travels into the small bowel where it binds to the newly freed B12 to form a B12 intrinsic factor complex. The B12 intrinsic factor complex is absorbed at the terminal ileum by passive transport and by pumps that use ATP or energy to push B12 into the cells that line the bowel. Each step in this process is important, and we will talk about how different diseases can lead to B12 deficiency based on different steps in this process. Folate is absorbed in a very different way from B12. Folate is found naturally in the form of folate polyglutamates, which is just folic acid 
connected to a series of glutamate groups. The body cleaves off these multiple glutamates to make folate monoglutamate. Folic acid is primarily absorbed in the jejunum, which is the middle section of the small bowel. Once absorbed, the folate undergoes several enzymatic processes so it can be used. Now that we've covered how B12 and folate are absorbed, let's look at how we can recognize B12 and folate deficiency. B12 and folate can present in very similar ways, but there are a few key differences. Keep in mind that symptoms alone are not enough to differentiate between folate and B12 deficiency, as many times these deficiencies can occur together. For both B12 and folate deficiencies, there are nonspecific symptoms that are going to be the most common. These include irritability, insomnia, cognitive slowing, and even restless leg syndrome. In severe folate deficiencies, oral ulcers can develop, while in severe B12 deficiency, a smooth tongue can develop due to the loss of papillae or bumps on the tongue responsible for taste. Typically, neurological symptoms occur with B12 deficiency rather than folate deficiency. These include symmetric numbness in the extremities, starting with the legs and progressing to the arms. A characteristic term when discussing neurological changes to the nervous system as a result of B12 deficiency is subacute combined degeneration of the dorsal and lateral columns of the spinal cord. The dorsal and lateral columns of the spinal cord are responsible for sensory inputs such as vibration sense and pain slash temperature sensation respectively. With B12 deficiency, there's a loss in the myelin or protein that surrounds the axons of the nerves. Myelin acts as insulation and allows for effective conduction of signals through nerves, similar to how insulation covering an electrical wire can protect and improve conduction. The degeneration of the dorsal and lateral columns of the spinal cord result in numbness and spasticity in the extremities. The signs and symptoms of B12 and folate deficiency can be very subtle, so it's also important to understand what can cause folate and B12 deficiency. We begin by first looking at the source of B12 and folate, which is our diet. Like with any nutrient deficiency, if a nutrient is not in our diet, it's easy to become deficient. Vegans are at high risk of becoming B12 deficient as they do not eat any animal products. In addition, alcoholics are at risk of both B12 and folate deficiency due to their overall poor diets as a result of their consumption of large amounts of alcohol. One disease that you must understand when talking about B12 deficiency is pernicious anemia. As we talked about before, the stomach plays a very important role in the absorption of B12. Remember, the parietal cells release intrinsic factor, which allows for the majority of B12 absorption to take place. Pernicious anemia is when the immune system attacks the parietal cells, leading to their destruction. We do not understand what the trigger is that causes pernicious anemia to occur, but once the parietal cells are destroyed by the immune system, this significantly reduces the amount of intrinsic factor produced. If intrinsic factor is not available to bind to B12, then there will be significantly less absorption of B12, resulting in B12 deficiency. Keep in mind, B12 deficiency takes months to develop, while folate deficiency typically can occur in a few weeks. Another cause of B12 and folate deficiency are extensive prior surgeries. Those who have undergone gastric bypass for weight loss can develop significant B12 deficiency because the portion of the stomach that produces stomach acid has been bypassed. This means there's less acidity in the gastric pouch to release B12 from food, and there's a reduced level of intrinsic factor to bind to the B12 for absorption. If someone undergoes a significant removal of small bowel, this can also lead to B12 and folate deficiencies, as there's not enough bowel to absorb the needed amount of B12 and folate. Even bacteria can affect the absorption of B12 and folate. Occasionally, there's a rapid growth of bad bacteria in the bowel in a disease called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, SIBO. 
Severe bacterial overgrowth can actually result in an increase in folate absorption, but impairs B12 absorption. The increase in folate is due to the bacteria naturally producing folate, which is taken up by the body. But the overgrowth causes inflammation in the ileum, leading to poor B12 absorption. Pernicious anemia is not the only autoimmune disorder that can lead to vitamin deficiency. Crohn's disease is an autoimmune inflammatory disorder that can cause ulcerations anywhere from the mouth to the rectum. Many times, Crohn's disease can involve the small bowel, preventing proper absorption of B12 and folate. In addition, many Crohn's disease patients unfortunately have to have partial small bowel resections, which as we discussed before, can promote B12 and folate deficiency. Medications can play a role in developing vitamin deficiencies. For example, metformin has been demonstrated to cause B12 deficiency. B12, when bound to intrinsic factor in the small bowel, requires energy and calcium to be taken up into the cells in the terminal ileum. Metformin disturbs the balance of calcium in these cells, preventing the uptake of B12. Increasing calcium intake can reverse these effects. Also, acid reflux medications like proton pump inhibitors can mildly affect B12 absorption by decreasing the acidity of the stomach, thereby preventing the release of B12 from food. Since the symptoms of B12 and folate deficiency can be difficult to identify, it is important to be able to diagnose the deficiency when suspected. Frequently, the first sign of B12 or folate deficiency is macrocytosis. During routine labs, if a CBC is obtained, there may be evidence of anemia or low hemoglobin. The MCV or mean corpuscular volume may be elevated. The MCV is a measure of the size of red blood cells. If the MCV is greater than 100, the RBCs are considered large, termed macrocytosis. Whenever you see a macrocytosis, consider vitamin B12 and folate deficiencies. But remember, these are not the only causes of enlarged red blood cells. If you suspect B12 and folate deficiencies, the first step is to take a very good history and physical to identify any of the features we discussed. If you suspect a specific diagnosis, order the appropriate testing to investigate the cause. For example, if you suspect someone has Crohn's disease, consider a CT abdomen pelvis and a colonoscopy for further evaluation. To test for B12 deficiency, order a serum B12, and for folate deficiency, you can order an RBC folate. Now, I should explain that I typically do not order folate testing anymore, as simply going straight to supplementation, if suspected, is cheaper without significant risks compared to testing for folate deficiency. For B12 deficiency, it's important to obtain a serum B12, methylmalonic acid, and homocysteine levels. Generally, if B12 is greater than 300 mg per deciliter, there is no B12 deficiency. If the level is 200 to 300, then this is considered borderline. If the level is less than 200, then that person is deficient. If you did order a folate, typically a folate greater than 4 is normal, with 2 to 4 being borderline, and less than 2 is deficient. Methylmalonic acid and homocysteine are indirect markers of B12 and folate deficiency. These markers can be used for borderline values to tell if there is B12 or folate deficiency. We won't review the details here, but it is important to understand that B12 and folate act as cofactors in the conversion of homocysteine and methylmalonic acid to other products. And without these cofactors, there will be an elevation in either homocysteine or homocysteine and methylmalonic acid. If the methylmalonic acid level and homocysteine levels are normal with a normal B12, then there's not likely a B12 or folate deficiency. If the methylmalonic acid and homocysteine levels are elevated together, then there is a B12 deficiency. But we cannot tell if there's an underlying folate deficiency. If the methylmalonic acid level is normal, but homocysteine is elevated, then there is a folate deficiency, but no B12 deficiency. If B12 deficiency is diagnosed and no other cause is suspected, it is important to consider pernicious anemia. 
Typically, pernicious anemia can be tested for by obtaining an anti-intrinsic factor. Anti-intrinsic factor has low sensitivity, but when found, points to pernicious anemia in the correct clinical setting. Some people order anti-parietal cell antibodies, but this has poor sensitivity and is not diagnostic for pernicious anemia. Many times, an elevation in anti-parietal cell antibody can be seen in other causes of gastritis or gastric inflammation, making it a poor test. Once a B12 or folate deficiency is recognized, it is important to treat the underlying cause if possible. For example, quitting the excessive use of alcohol or treating the underlying process like with Crohn's disease. In some cases, the underlying cause cannot be treated, so supplementation alone is needed. B12 deficiency can be treated either with injections of B12, high-dose B12 pills, or even a nasal spray for B12. Folate is supplemented with oral pills of 1 or more milligrams per day and can be given in an injection form as well. Well, that was a brief review of B12 and folate deficiencies. If you like our discussion, make sure to subscribe, like, and share. This is Dr. K from My Medical School, and I'll see you next time.